What's happening, everybody? Welcome to the show. We are your hosts, Chase and Miles, and we are at the Lucky Duck. But today, Miles cannot be a part of the show. He is off somewhere way better than where we are right now, <laughs> canoeing to a treehouse in the Amazonian forest or something <laughs> like that. No, but uh, for all seriousness, he uh, he's he's uh, out having adventures with uh, Sarah, his wife. If you guys want to check out what he's up to, go to their Instagram page at Adventuring Eyes or AdventuringEyes.com. But the reason we're here today is something much more magical, <laughs> which is I get to sit down with the one, the only, Michael Butler. Welcome, sir. Sorry, hey. hold, hold on. Dr. <laughs> Michael Butler. Yeah, right. Get it right, Chase. <laughs> <laughs> um, for the audience members who have followed us from the very beginning, we often talk or reference Michael. It's quite uh, often that we say, when Michael comes on, or we're trying to get Michael to come on. <laughs> Uh, I'm a busy guy. Here, here it is. This is today's the day, and so welcome uh, to the Lucky Duck. Thank you. Um, it's been two years in the making. For every when we start every episode, we cheers. Okay. So here we go. Here's to a, a good episode. Yeah. Oh yeah. Here's the ASMR sip. Yeah. Fuck yeah. <laughs> um, today we are drinking a watermelon cucumber. Lemonade cocktail. I don't quite have a name for it. That's it's working in title. I kind of just threw it together last minute. Uh, in fact, that's kind of what we're all about here is just <laughs> like approachable drinks that you can make at home. Uh, okay. Once in a while, I'll throw in a cool, cool little cocktail that requires a little more like, you know, finesse to sure, put together. Sure. Uh, and, but um, yeah, this is this is definitely one uh, that you can you can do at home. Uh, so yeah, welcome, man. Thanks. Thanks for being on. Thanks for uh, agreeing to do this. Glad it could finally get out. I could finally get, finally get out here. Yeah, you know, make it happen. There's a lot of nego- There's been about two years of negotiating with his manager yeah, to try to get yeah. him to do the yeah, the podcast the right, circuit. Yeah, uh, but for uh, sure, for sure, this is the first stop. So. <laughs> <laughs> I think Andrew Huberman's next, right? Oh and, yeah, yeah, right, right. Andrew Huberman. <laughs> um, you know, Peter Atia. You know, we'll go through the list. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, so Patrick. yeah, all those good ones, <laughs> I guess, I guess we can kind of just kick things off with like, you know, introducing what you do, how you became, you know, where you are in your career and like what you're focused on mm-hmm. at the current moment. Cool. So I'll kind of leave that over to you. I am a neuroscientist, I guess, by training. Um, I say that hesitantly cause I feel like a lot of times what I do lately is less neuroscience focused, although it ultimately is. But um, yeah, neuroscience by training. I got my PhD in neuroscience in 2019 from Florida State University Hmm. and then moved to the great state of Ohio and uh, uh, moved to Columbus, Ohio to take a postdoctoral position, postdoctoral research um, position at Ohio State, or I'm sorry, the Ohio State. Oh my God! They they will get mad yes. if you don't do that. <laughs> you, had, you had to put the emphasis <laughs> and the the before yeah, Ohio State. The Ohio State TM. Yes. By the way. Um, Damn. And so, is this? Do you get training on that? That when you when you got hired, they're like, <laughs> we there's a whole boot camp course on how to pronounce. No, actually, the first uh, conference I went to where you have like your institution on your badge like i really debated for several minutes on whether or not i should write the ohio state or just ohio state university i went with ohio state university because i honestly sorry ohio state i think it's a little pretentious Mm. but everyone else from my institution that was from ohio state had the ohio state so i felt a little a little out of place i feel Mm. like i should have so now i just go with the the i just embrace the the ohio state university but, um, yeah, I'm at the Wexner Medical Center there, um, and I do neuroimmunology research, um, particularly as it pertains to Alzheimer's disease. Um, and the main goal of our research is to understand um, and identify like early triggers of Alzheimer's disease and mm-hmm. sort of the mechanisms through which that occurs. 
in the brain, uh, between uh, the brain and the immune system communication. And you and I go way, way back. Yes. Uh, so just for everybody who's listening, uh, Michael and I became best friends in college. My freshman year, we kind of linked up. We had known each other from high school because yes. we grew up in the same hometown. Right. Went to the same high yes, school. Exactly. We had anatomy together. Yes. Yeah. Do you remember who was the teacher? Claudine Randall. Coach Claudine Randall. Claudine Randall. <laughs> Shout out to Claudine. <laughs> what a name. Yeah. Um, and uh, we had a few... Um, we had a few, uh, uh, mutual friends, yeah, uh, yeah, throughout some that mutual friends. and, uh, linked up at a party before I went to college and yeah. you're like, Hey, I'm going there too. And we, that kind of kicked that off and right. became roommates and the rest is history. So yeah, since 2010, right. Yeah. Or you, you, we both started at FSU the same year actually, cause I did my first year of college. Mm hmm. When I was young and dumb and wanting to go to UF, uh, you know, <laughs> I did my first year uh, actually at Santa Fe Community College because yeah. I did not get into UF. Mm -hmm. um, but I quickly wised up and decided that Florida State was where I should be. So I transferred to Florida State after a year. Yeah. So my first year there was also your first year there. Yes. And so we just kind of hit it off. We were like, hey, we know each other from the same hometown. Let's yeah. uh, hang out in this new city. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, so many friend, beautiful friendships uh, kind of formed out of, out of the, the, uh, the mashup that we created. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. Uh, including meeting my wife. So Exactly. There's yeah. There's arguably you guys would not be together if you, know, <laughs> you did not know me. So. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> I'll take um, credit for that. Yeah. <laughs> as you should. As you should. <laughs> uh, yeah. And, and uh, neuroscience wasn't something that you initially – pursued when I first met you, you were actually going for psychology yeah. and then social work quickly after that, Good memory. Which, <laughs> which just developed into, uh, forming relationships with labs and at, on campus. And then that trickled into a graduate program for yeah, you. And yeah. So like the general sort of trajectory was, yeah. Like when I was in high school, I took like AP psychology, um, and thought that that's what I wanted to do. Like I, I liked the brain. I wanted to study, human behavior, psychology. I thought it was really interesting and really like relatable and applicable to myself and to everyone. And so that's what I went into in college wanting to study. I wanted to be like a clinical psychologist, or, like a counselor, something like that. I just thought that that would be a cool profession. And so I started doing that. And then, uh, so I, I majored in psychology and then my junior year, I want to say, uh, or like halfway through my sophomore year, I learned about this other degree called social work, which like allowed you to become a counselor mm. with a uh, less training or not less training, but like less schooling. Right. Mm. And it was quicker. You didn't have to like go get a PhD or anything like that. You can kind of just, um, you know, get, get your master's in social work and then you can be like a licensed clinical social worker and still actually get to do the counseling component mm -hmm. um just without all like the the phd and like the research um side of psychology which honestly ironically like i just didn't like psychology research yeah. i took a research class because you had to for the psych major and i just thought it was boring i hated statistics i hated mm. i just didn't like any of it and so i never thought it, research was for me and then i did two semesters of the social work major and an internship with um, 211 Big Bend, which is like the suicide slash like social services, like helpline basically for like the panhandle area mm -hmm. in West Florida, uh, North and West Florida. And I didn't really like that. Like it was my first training experience with like actually talking to people and counseling people. Um, like going through the process of learning how to counsel people. I never actually right. took like a call or anything like that mm. um, for someone who was like feeling suicidal, luckily, because I feel like I would not have handled that well. Mm -hmm. But I did like two or three months of training to do it. And like by the end of it, I was just kind of like, I don't think this is really going to be for me. And so I quit that. And I was like, I don't think I want to do social work anymore. Mm. And I didn't really know where to turn. And so I, that's when I kind of like kind of came back to like the brain a little bit heavier and, and into like the actual like biology of the brain. Like I wanted to, like, that was an interesting idea for me or an interesting, like, um, 
you know, topic to pursue because I had always, you know, grown up with Tourette syndrome. Mm. And so I was really interested in how my brain, uh, which was clearly different from someone else's that didn't have Tourette syndrome. Mm. Um, like I was, I was interested to understand like how my brain was different. And so I thought the brain would be a good thing to study in a little bit more of a, um, a objective, like literal way as opposed to like psychology, which can be a little bit more, I guess, like not biological. Mm. And so that's what I turned to neuroscience, which is like the combination of this like biology and psychology. Right. And so that's when I was like, well, how do I do neuroscience? And you have to join a lab, you have to like get research experience. And so Mm. that's where like actual, um, you know, my introduction to like biology and like, um, neuroscience and like lab based science, um, you know, science came into play. How do you, how did you, um, how did you figure out the track, uh, of how you needed to do that? Was it something that you like went to a counselor to understand or like an advi- a rather an advisor? Yeah. I and went they were to, like, here's what you need to do. Here's step one, step two. Pretty much. Like I, I, I didn't really know what neuroscience really even meant. Like mm-hmm. I was just like, it was like the biology of the brain, right? Like that's, that, that's what neuroscience is. And I was like, how do I study this? I just Googled like FSU neuroscience and there's a neuroscience pro- graduate program. Mm-hmm. I contacted the administrator for that program who set me up a meeting with the director of the program. Um, and so I, I mean, he didn't know who I was. He just took a meeting with some random undergrad and looking back now, I feel like that's a really generous thing for him to do. Like he's a professor, he runs his own lab and he runs the program, but he took time to meet with some, you know, random, random (laughs) undergrad who had some questions about the program Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and about the field and, and, you know, how to get involved. And so, yeah, I had like a quick meeting with him and he said, you know, Research experience is the number one thing you need to get into a graduate program if that's what you want to do. And so uh, he said, just email some labs and try to get try, try to see which ones are available mm. for, you know, an undergraduate position. So that's what I did. And then fast forward, you're getting your Ph.D. and then yeah. applying for other labs around the country. right? Yeah. So I did like two years. So that, that was like halfway. So. January so like spring semester of my junior year was my first semester in a lab of January 2012 and I worked there for over two years like two and a half years until I got into a program I kind of extended my I I did graduate but I stayed on part-time and took extra some couple extra biology courses like advanced Mm -hmm. bio courses to like increase my or to, to improve my um you know, transcript and application and like just background information. Cause I didn't have a lot of biology courses up until that point. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's what you need for neuroscience, um, graduate programs. And mm-hmm. so I took some extra courses part-time after graduation and worked in the lab that I was volunteering in as a technician for a year. And then finally in sort of, uh, fall of 2014, I joined the, I stayed at FSU and, um, joined their PhD program, um, for neuroscience. I switched labs, but same, you know, program, same track. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Tourette's, uh, obviously plays a big role in your life. Yeah. Um, when did you first find out that you had Tourette's? I mean, technically found out, I guess would be, or technically diagnosed would be when I was like 18, my Mm -hmm. first year of college actually in Gainesville, Mm -hmm. my symptoms had gotten quite bad. Um, because I think I was a little stressed first time being away from home, like all these new experiences. Mm -hmm. And so it just kind of exacerbated stress is a normal, like exaggerate, you know, accelerator of symptoms. And so I just was getting really frustrated with them and uh, wanted to like see if I could figure anything out, you know, and how to like, you know, decrease them. Mm-hmm. And so I actually sought like medical attention for the first time regarding my Tourette syndrome. Mm-hmm. But I had known probably for quite a few years, um, just self-diagnosed, like Mm. looking up at, you know, looking up symptoms on Google, like why am I randomly twitching or making these noises and Mm -hmm. stuff like that. And so, um, and I was sometime in high school, I think that I like, you know, 
or maybe even late middle school that I like Googled, um, my, you know, what I was experiencing and saw this thing right. called Tourette syndrome. I was like, that sounds like exactly what I like, exactly like what I have. So, now, at that time when I, and I remember the, the exact moment <laughs> location, uh, when you told me the Tourette's <laughs> yeah. and, um, it was outside your dorm, is that outside my right? dorm. Yeah. Yeah. The yeah. graph. Yeah. 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 <laughs> And, um, at that particular time, and I think I can speak for a lot of people my age or like just the generation in, in general, mm. my experience or like in pop, even in pop culture, like understanding of Tourette's was the Tourette's guy on YouTube. Oh yeah. And, <laughs> Bob um, Saget. Bob Saget. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, uh, Not Bob Saget, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The guy that yelled Bob Saget. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And so that was my, or like South Park, they also yeah. did like a whole episode yeah. about that and stuff. So, um, and you, but your, your tick is mostly just motor <laughs> and then, you know, the vocal. Yeah. Um, so for Tourette syndrome, uh, I'm not a clinician, so I mm-hmm. could have this wrong and they may, they change things all the time. Right. But to my understanding, to be diagnosed with Tourette syndrome, you have to have both motor and vocal tics. Gotcha. Um, <laughs> there's other tick disorders mm-hmm. that wouldn't that maybe you just have a motor tick or maybe you just have a vocal tick, but, and I don't know the names of like what those disorder tick disorders would be exactly. Right. Like there's probably a couple, but for Tourette syndrome, my understanding is it has to be, um, both. And for like X amount of time, like over a longer period of time, like hmm. it can't be a chronic, I mean, an acute thing where it's just right. temporary. And, uh, and, and maybe you don't quite, maybe you do, or maybe you don't, but could you explain to the audience a little bit more about the science behind or the biology behind, uh, what, what's going on with Tourette syndrome? Yeah. I mean, it's a pretty difficult disorder to study because mm-hmm. it's really difficult to model mm-hmm. in a preclinical setting, uh, you know, or in, in a preclinical organism, right? Like a rodent or something like that, where you can really dig into the mechanisms because, um, you're allowed to, you know, do things ethically with, you know, rodents that we, that we can't do with humans for, like you know, stakes, for, for good reason. Like take samples of brain tissue. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, that. like yeah, take, yeah. Like, yeah, take actual tissue, brain tissue, mm-hmm. look at changes in, you know, gene exp- you know, different genes that are involved, um, you know, in specific tissues or regions in the brain. Uh, I mean, we can do a ton of crazy things in, you know, animal, like preclinical neuroscience that we just cannot do in humans. Uh, we, um, can study brains of rodents at a really, really, really detailed high resolution level mm-hmm. that the technology in a living human to do that uh, is just not there right now. Mm -hmm. And so Tourette syndrome is a very like human thing. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, mice and rats or any other kind of like preclinical model, even like non-human primates, like don't just spontaneously have Tourette syndrome to our understand, you know, to our knowledge anyway. Mm -hmm. And so I think the mechanisms are pretty lacking in terms of like what we know about what causes or, you know, what actually is going quote unquote wrong or different Mm. in a person's brain with Tourette syndrome. Um, but to my understanding, it's related to, um, brain regions that are important for like voluntary movements, you know, places, um, you know, regions like the basal ganglia, Mm. um, you know, motor cortex, these are, you know, in the, in basically the, the circuitry that's connecting those two, um, you know, these regions. And Mm. so, um, I admittedly not an expert in Tourette syndrome neuroscience, uh, even though that's what propelled me into neuroscience in the first place. I genuinely never have studied it in the lab setting or like in a, in a professional way. I try to occasionally read a paper or mm. attend a presentation at a conference or something if there are some on Tourette syndrome, mm-hmm. but it's pretty understudied even in the field of neuroscience. Mm. Um, like when I go to the big neuroscience conference each year, society for neuroscience, um, I mean, there's literally 30,000 neuroscientists there, maybe four presentations than the entire week yeah. are related to Tourette syndrome. Interesting. And so it's 
just really not a lot is known, right? Unfortunately, um, and that is that maybe I mean you you've described the 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 obstacles that we face in order to to try to understand them, but mm-hmm. maybe uh, and this is just me spitballing, but maybe it's because it's something that's not necessarily lethal. Mm-hmm. Is, can you is that is yeah. this is Tourette something that can develop into something that can cause potentially something. Other than like mental health decline, uh, yeah. you know, is it something that can lead to like, uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, loss of life? Or? I mean, there's severe self injurious mm. tics that people have, right? Yeah. Like hitting themselves okay. in the head or, you know, like punching wall, like hitting wall, like just being, I yeah. mean, there's, you know, extreme cases where, mm-hmm. you know, news pieces and stuff where you'll see a patient with Tourette syndrome and they're like, their house is destroyed basically the, the the bedroom that they're in gotcha yeah you know and it's yeah. just you know the parents are like at their wits end like they have no idea how to help their child wow. with this syndrome <clears throat> right and mm-hmm. i'm very lucky that i never had something like that mm-hmm. like my s- symptoms were very mild um yeah. for most of my life and um you know it's not really any self injurious type stuff and um I just have very minor like motor twitches, you know, Mm -hmm. head and neck, um, sometimes arms and legs, and then Mm. a pretty consistent vocal tick of, Mm. you know, something like that, where it just sounds like a throat clearing or like a hiccup. Right. Um, Sometimes it gets a little bit more higher pitched, um, Mm -hmm. you know, depending on how stressed I am. Um, But yeah, so nothing crazy um um, nothing too debilitating i'd say like Mm -hmm. you know nothing that like caused me too much i mean not too much like quality of life lost type. yeah Yeah. you know just the typical like insecurity for sure Mm -hmm. like it was a huge issue um for me i try to hide it as much as i could and for honestly 18 19 years of my life i never told anybody about it or never like addressed. I'd tried to suppress the ticks as much as I could when I was around people, mm-hmm. which honestly caused more anxiety and more stress and made the ticks worse. Mm. And, um, so that was actually ended up being what my, the psychiatrist that I saw, you know, we tried a couple of different medications for it. Um, people, the, the first line of, you know, Med- first line medications for Tourette syndrome are typically low dose antipsychotics actually. Um, really? so like, um, mostly dopamine receptor antagonists. Mm-hmm. Dopamine is really important for movement actually. Really? Um, yeah. I mean with like with Parkinson's for example, right. Um, mm. people with Parkinson's disease, the reason that the cause of Parkinson's disease is loss of neurons in the brain that produce dopamine and so dopamine everyone associates with like motivation reward which is true but it also has another function which is aiding in voluntary movement and so um so dopamine is involved in Tourette syndrome as well and so um they actually think that perhaps maybe uh, one of the early hypotheses of Tourette syndrome was related to like maybe too much dopamine in the um uh leftover between connection you know at at the synapse you know the connection between two neurons there's like a little too much dopamine left over Hmm. was like the original one of the original hypotheses and that was causing this like dysregulation in movement and other you know i mean technically vocal motion you know vocal vocalizations are technically motor right to some Mm -hmm. degree and so i think they that was one of the reasons that the first line medications used to be, or maybe still is, um, you know, dopamine receptor antagonists. If you block the dopamine receptor, maybe that leftover dopamine can't do anything because there's no receptor for it to bind to. Right. And so, um, we tried a couple of different versions of those types of drugs and none of them really worked. And they actually made me feel really, um, like, zombie almost and just really kind of um just sedated and like not good and so i didn't like them but ultimately the best medication quote unquote um ended up being to just tell people Mm. (laughs) and um just let them know like don't try to hide it just Just tell your friends own it own it Mm. and just say like this is what i have i can't help it And your friends, you know, he was like, your friends will understand. They probably already know (laughs) and they accept it about you. And so, um, you know, just, it'll probably help your, you know, stress 
and mm -hmm. that ended up being the best um, way for me to handle it. Um, so I, I progressed to telling a few close friends. Actually, Raquel, um, Raquel Rudolph was, um, who we both know, mm -hmm. was the first friend that I told, and she was like so great about it, and it made it easier to you know tell other people. Yeah, it just kind of snowballed and, your confidence. Yeah, telling. yeah. and um, you know, I got to the point where I was like telling classes about it, you know, small classes where it would be very prevalent and, mm -hmm. um, you know, and then everyone, ev everyone was super chill about it. You know, mm -hmm. I never really had too many negative reactions. There were a few, but not, you know, anything mm -hmm. crazy. Um, and so, so yeah. So stress and uncomfortable situations, mm -hmm probably make it more pronounced or yeah. antagonize it yeah is that is that is there anything else that was surprising to you that that brought something your your symptoms on or um uh positive stress actually as well like if, oh yeah <laughs> just general excitement about something okay. yeah like even mm -hmm. if you're happy and pumped and ready excited about whatever like yeah even that would you know it is still like a stress, right. um, yeah. a positive stress, and it would still cause, you know, the, you know, a slight increase in the tick mm -hmm. occurrence. Does, um, uh, I'm just curious, this just came to me, but does exercise help at all? I don't know if there's any like actual data on like whether or not X amount of exercise per day or per week, like mm -hmm. decrease the ticks, but like in general exercise <laughs> helps because it takes your mind off. I mean, you're doing something mm -hmm. that's preoccupying yourself and yeah. um you know it kind of takes your mind off something um so yeah. like you know yeah and in, in a sense exercise can can help but i don't know yeah. if it actually like it may just be like a byproduct like a lot of people <laughs> prescribe exercise to decrease stress yeah for that yeah yeah that, so that's that, true I'm sure yeah, that's like an indirect uh, yeah. affects the i think ticks, exercise yeah. would probably indirectly help yeah um tourette syndrome so so tourette's got you interested in neuroscience, but now yeah. your, your focus is on Alzheimer's and that's what you're <laughs> yeah. studying in at the Ohio state university. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, tell me more about that. Maybe we can get into like what Alzheimer's is like, sure. what your understanding is, what the particular field that you're studying right now or have been. Yeah. Yeah. So Alzheimer's is a really, it's the most common form of dementia, um, probably the most common neurodegenerative disease. So you have this like umbrella term, which is like neurodegenerative diseases. And these are, you know, Parkinson's, for example, is one of those. Mm -hmm. um, Huntington's disease, which people might have heard of, is another one. Mm -hmm. um, ALS, you know, like what Stephen Hawking had. Um is a neurodegenerative disorder or a disease. Wasn't that um, the disease that we were growing awareness with the ice bucket challenge? <laughs> ice bucket challenge. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. Everybody and knows so, that one. Yeah. <laughs> and so, so yeah, those are all kind of neurodegenerative diseases. Okay. And then dementia is, you know, like a sub umbrella term. And then right. underneath the umbrella of dementia is uh, something like Alzheimer's disease, which I think probably roughly makes about like Alzheimer's or, you know, make up about 70% of the di uh, dementia diagnoses. Wow. And, you know, dementia is, of course, this, you know, abrupt or, you know, severe cognitive decline, basically, like your inability, you know, memory loss, you know, problem solving, um, all types of, you know, cognitive functions are declining um, mm -hmm. in dementias. And Alzheimer's is no different. Alzheimer's, you have this, you know, usually starts with like short term memory loss, you know, repeating themselves, you know, people usually repeat themselves or, you know, forget minor, you know, small things, um, problems with num, you know, they start having problems with numbers and doing like simple calculations, um, you know, and, and this is sort of the, you know, the typical like beginning stages of something like Alzheimer's disease. Mm. And, um, you know, so it's a very prevalent disease. Um, I mean, we probably all know someone, unfortunately, uh, mm -hmm. either directly or indirectly that has had it. And, um, you know, both of my, um, I, my grandma had it, um, my mm -hmm. wife's, um, uh, both her grandparents, uh, you know, a couple of her grandparents had it. And so, you know, it's, definitely a personal thing as well for mm -hmm. for me and, and my family is it a um, genetic thing 
like hereditary it can wise? Be. Um, there are certain forms of like, it's called familial Alzheimer's disease. Okay. They only make up about 5% of total oh, Alzheimer's wow. cases, a very small percentage. Um, and they're usually early onset, you know, like before the age of 55, you know, like really young. Wow. And so, but it, it, those are, like I said, 95% of Alzheimer's cases are what they call sporadic Alzheimer's disease. Um, and they're usually late onset, you know, after the age of 65 mm -hmm. and, um, they are not necessarily genetic in the sense that they're like inherited, mm -hmm. but it does like, you know, it's, it, they're not like directly inherited, but they're diseases that have genetic predispositions to them, right? Like if you, you know, there are certain gene variants that individuals can have that will increase the risk for developing Alzheimer's right. disease. So get your 23 <laughs> and me folks. Yeah, exactly. And so there's nothing, but even if you have those gene variants, right. there's nothing that will guarantee that you would get Alzheimer's right. disease, yeah. you know, yeah. and there's nothing that guarantee if you have, and, and there are certain gene variants that are like, quote unquote, protective or like you're less mm. likely to get Alzheimer's disease, but you can still get Alzheimer's disease. Right, so yeah. it's not a perfectly it's based on like data, right. Of what we know. Yeah. yeah. And so um, there's always exceptions essentially. Mm -hmm. And so, so yeah, it's not in per se, you know, 95% of the cases are not genetic and, um, you know, there's a lot that we've learned about Alzheimer's disease over the last, you know, 30, you know, 40. I mean, it was, I can't remember the year that it was actually coined, but mm -hmm. it was early 1900s. Okay. And so, but, you know, we've learned a lot, especially in the last, you know, you know, couple decades about Alzheimer's disease, but it's still not, there's no cure. There's, you know, and I wouldn't, you know, I, I, there's still a ton of work that needs to be done before we, I think, will make substantial, you know, progress mm -hmm. in, in finding a cure. Really? Yeah. Yeah. And I would argue, I mean, this is just my bias. This is sort of where our lab kind of, or the lab that I'm in kind of uh, lands. But I would say, like, efforts are going to be better served towards figuring out how to prevent Alzheimer's disease yes. early on as opposed to curing Alzheimer's disease once it's diagnosed. Yeah. Because like Parkinson's disease, like, they always say, like, I, I could have the numbers wrong here, but, like, by the time someone with Parkinson's disease starts showing like actual tremors or like motor mm -hmm. symptoms, oh, like over 50% or larger, you know, of the, or more of those neurons that make dopamine are already gone. Right. So you know, the damage so is already done. Damage is yeah. already done. Same mm -hmm. thing with Alzheimer's disease. Yeah. By the time you actually have significant like clinical observation of like cognitive decline, it's likely that the changes that were happening in the brain that led to those cognitive deficits yeah. were happening for years, de you know, mm -hmm. up to two decades prior. Right. And so finding a drug that is going to like reverse all of that quickly, I think is, I mean, it would be amazing. And I think it, I'm not going to say it's not possible, but I think it's a hard task. It's going to be probably it's a, a tall while, task. Yeah. yeah. Unless somebody comes with like a, some sort of un, like the discovery of penicillin just yeah. accidentally yeah. like rubs into something <laughs> that, that ends yeah. up being like a miracle drug or something. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, I think that, <clears throat> you know, the efforts to slow progress mm -hmm. once Alzheimer's is diagnosed is noble like we should yeah. like yes unfortunately you know we are not not every case can or will be prevented and so we have to figure out how to you know um slow or reverse uh signs of you know symptoms mm -hmm. of alzheimer's um prolonged and, quality you know, of yeah, life prolonged quality yeah. of life exactly mm -hmm. and I think that there are some drugs that can do that mm -hmm. and they're, but they're not, you know, but they, it's yeah. not really to the point that it would be super meaningful, mm -hmm. um, you know, a super meaningful extension of, of, of quality of life. And I think that, um, like I said, efforts would be better, you know, a, a higher degree of success is likely, I think with identifying those early, you know, triggers of mm -hmm. Alzheimer's disease and what is happening to cause it to, mm -hmm. you know, develop and looking at ways to mitigate that. And, you know, it's a little, I mean, it's, it, 
Yeah. So, I mean, I think that's kind of where, I mean, that's where our lab tries to, you know, focus the efforts. That's where a lot mm-hmm. of people focus the efforts, but both are needed, right? Like, I think mm-hmm. labs and companies that are developing drugs to slow or reverse late stage Alzheimer's disease mm-hmm. should continue. But, yeah. you know, other efforts should also be pursued, which is, like I said, these early, you know, things like prevention. Yeah. And so, so is, that's where I tr- focus. Is this the most commonly studied degenerative degenerative neurological disease? <laughs> uh, I don't know if the exact answer, but I would probably say yes. It's yeah. definitely, I think, the most diagnosed. It's the most prevalent. Right. I believe the cases are higher of Alzheimer's disease than they are of like Parkinson's, Mm -hmm. but Parkinson's and Alzheimer's are the two big ones that people study. Mm -hmm. But I think Alzheimer's leads the way in terms of amount of funding and like, you know, resources devoted to it. Yeah. So let's get into like, what are you guys particularly studying in your lab about it? And, and, and let's expand upon that a little bit. Yeah. So what we're studying is, um, different environmental factors. So environmental meaning like non-genetic factors. Okay. Um, so not like environmental toxins or anything like that, but just like, things like diet. Yes, exactly. Exercise, things yeah. like that. So, yeah. you know, a little bit already, <laughs> but like just the broad picture is yeah. like, we study environmental factors that can, um, accelerate cognitive or memory deficits mm-hmm. in, um, aging or, um, you know, uh, in, in models of aging and Alzheimer's disease. Hmm. And so those environmental factors that we study mostly are things like diet, um, peripheral, you know, sort of bacterial infections and, um, actually, uh, surgeries. Um, and so oh. those three things, infections, surgeries, and diet, <clears throat> excuse me, all kind of serve as a, um, trigger for abrupt, deficits in memory in aged rodents Hmm. and non-human primates. And this is all also documented in human literature as well, Mm -hmm. um, that these factors can aid in the progression of cognitive deficits in aged organisms. Hmm. And so what we do is study the, the mechanisms of like how that happens. So we will take our, our rodents, our rats or our mice that are, you know, old, or, and then we have, you know, the control groups that are young Mm -hmm. and we'll give them either a bacterial infection, we'll give them an unhealthy diet, we'll give them a, um, surgery and then study what are the differences in their memory between the young and the old animals and what is different in the brain about those young and the old animals. And what all the data are pointing to is looking at how the, um, these triggers, infection, diet, and surgery, all lead to this sort of um, huge increase in brain inflammation. Mm. And we, so inflammation in the brain is likely, I mean, it's pretty definitive that, or that that's one of the definitive triggers of, of cognitive decline with aging mm-hmm. and the development of like true, like, you know, persistent, you know, dementia and you know, neurodegeneration. Mm-hmm. And so again, we're kind of looking at the exact, you know, inflammatory mechanisms that are, um, induced by those stimuli that lead to the impairment in, in memory in the rodents. And, and in inflammation, I think a lot of people, at least myself became more familiar with the word. I mean, we all kind of know what it, what, yeah. what it is, but COVID brought <laughs> that word back to the zeitgeist. Yeah. A lot of COVID symptoms or what was causing, what COVID was causing was inflammation in our body. For sure. Um, I mean, any viral infection right. or bacterial infection does that, right? But, you know, with COVID being, you know, as, yeah. as popular in, in, you know, in our lives in the last couple of years as was, we became a little more hyper aware of, of that word or what, yeah. you know, inflammation in the body in general. Mm-hmm. So can you explain exactly when you talk about inflammation in the brain, what is that exactly? Yeah, it's a good question. And it's weirdly not an easy question to answer directly, I think. Um, I think there, it's not like you know, a clear cut definition in the field of like neuroimmunology. Mm -hmm. But in general, I think what most people would call inflammation in the brain is the increase of 
inflammatory markers, which would be <laughs> things like pro-inflammatory cytokines, which are these like molecules that are released by immune cells. Mm -hmm. um, so you will see in a, you know, in a brain that we would call inflamed or that has inflammation, you'll see a higher level of these inflammatory proteins, inflammatory molecules mm -hmm. in the brain compared to a brain that isn't, you know, inflamed. And, you know, of course, that might also mean that there's more immune cells in the brain or in a particular brain region, um, you know, relative to a brain that doesn't have you know, inflammation. And it's, it's, it's kind of nuanced because inflammation is neither like inherently good or bad. It's all mm. about homeostasis and like striking a balance between, you know, um, you know, too much or too little and like too little, like no inflammation or no amount of these same molecules I'm referring to these pro-inflammatory cytokines are also bad for brain function. Really? And so, yeah, so it's not <laughs> like, you know, straightforward, like binary, you know, black or white. Mm -hmm. And so it's, um, but in general, what n inflammation means anywhere in any tissue is sort of this increase in immune cell activity or mm -hmm. reactivity mm -hmm. and um, a release of these inflammatory molecules that immune cells use to communicate with each other. So why is it that a little bit no is is a bad thing like what is it doing to increase cognition or brain function and why is too much a bad thing yeah so uh, you know a certain amount of these cytokines in the brain are actually important for maintaining things like synaptic plasticity okay so that um, means like the 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 uh how easy it is for neurons to communicate to each other yeah more or less yeah it's the ability you know plasticity is the kind of used as a term to describe like the brain's ability to change. Like when something's plastic, it's very like fluid, you know, fluid yeah. and like um, malleable. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And our brain is a super fluid, malleable organ, right? There's a lot of, you know, learning, you know, synaptic or like neuroplasticity is necessary for being able to learn and adapt, mm -hmm. you know, changing of communication between neurons, you know, um, establishing new connections between neurons, you know, these are all important things and these are all fall under like that term of like plasticity. And so the presence of some of these molecules, these cytokines that are released by immune cells, um, do serve to help like just that basal level mm -hmm. of, of learning and memory and like plasticity. So if you completely remove that, you know, you're moving something, you're removing something that these cells, these neurons in the brain are normally used to receiving, you know, mm -hmm. signals from to help with their plasticity, um, or help with, you know, forming new connections. And the reason why that, you know, too much is bad mm. is because too much of them can ultimately be sort of toxic or, you mm. know, it's not going to necessarily kill the cell, but I mean, too much of it would for too long a period of time, mm. um, would, you know, cause damage. Neur neuronal damage yeah. and, you know, lead to, you know, changes in uh, removal of synapses and stuff like that. And yeah. so it's really striking a balance, you know, everything in biology, there's always these like push pull mechanisms in biology and everything in biology is geared to be in homeostasis and anything that sort of tilts the scale too far in one direction is mm -hmm. typically going to result in something that's not optimal. So if we had too much inflammation in our brain, would that result in something that one could call like a brain fog or something like that? Yeah. I think that in general, I, you know, it, symptoms can vary it depends on the region where the inflammation is happening. Mm -hmm. Um, but something like brain fog, um, you know, it could be related to an inflammatory response mm -hmm. in the brain. In fact, there's decent, you know, there's some evidence that would suggest that the brain fog associated with, um, you know, long COVID, um, is mm. related to, brain inflammation. Mm -hmm. Again, it's kind of hard to measure, especially right. in humans. Um, brain inflammation is getting, we're getting better at measuring it in humans, but mm -hmm. it's not as easy to measure as it is in rodents mm -hmm. or in other preclinical models. Um, 
so it's a little hard to say definitively, but yeah. it is likely that some kind of underlying inflammatory response in the brain is um, related to brain fog that might be happening, at least mm -hmm. in like post-viral syndromes like yeah. COVID. So you guys have made, uh, have you found evidence then, like def maybe not definitively, but like on the track of maybe saying that good diet you know, consistent exercise does reduce mm -hmm. overall inflammation. Yeah. So, I mean, so we know that if we give an animal or a, a mouse or a rat, a high fat diet, uh, or a Western di a processed diet, I mean, it's, uh, you know, the, the diet that we give <laughs> is sort of like a high, high fat, moderate carb diet. It's not a ketogenic diet or anything mm. like that. It's like a, has a high amount of saturated fat, high amount of processed carbohydrates, like refined carbohydrates, essentially zero fiber, you know, so it, like we can't, the way that we study the diet isn't to identify a particular nutrient or, okay. you know, yeah, not, it, it, we aren't looking to identify like the, you know, exact nutrient or macronutrient that's like contributing mm -hmm. to any of this. It's just how does like a overall generally like obesogenic diet, like mm -hmm. a high cal calorie yeah. calorically dense diet that is going to cause weight gain and, mm -hmm. you know, metabolic dysfunction. Um, how does that compare to like the standard, like <clears throat> well-balanced, like healthy diet that the rodents get? And what would that look like? You, so you described like a high dense saturated fats and, and yeah. all that. What, 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 what's the, so, so the good diet that you're giving them? Yeah. So the good diet consists of, um, you know, again, moderate fat, low, you know, low carb. It, it's like, I think close to like 50% carbohydrate diet, I think the, the, the general fat content is close to like 20 something percent of mm -hmm. the calories come from fat okay. and, you know, like 20 or so percent from protein and the carbohydrate sources in those diets are mostly, um, um, uh, complex mm -hmm. carbohydrates, you know, so a lot of fiber mm -hmm. and like, just like, you know, whole grain type things. Right. And the comparison to the what we call the high fat diet is it's like, that's a 60% of the calories wow. come from, from fat. And most of those calories, uh, and, and a lot of those, those fats are saturated fat. Yeah. And we have like, you know, it's like a 20% carbohydrate diet, but the carbohydrate sources are refined carbohydrates or, mm -hmm. you know, like processed and yeah. no fiber, you know, McDonald's, like Chick-fil-A, yeah. actually Pizza the, Hut. The, 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 <laughs> the, the equivalent, it, this is legitimate. The, yeah. the sort of like the translational equivalent of what this diet is, uh -huh. is like the macronutrient composition of the diet is similar to that of like a Burger King, like double, oh double Whopper God. with cheese. <laughs> um, yeah. So that's kind of, I'm sorry, Burger King, yeah. don't come after me. Hey man, um, that's, uh, you know, that's for somebody. That's kind of like the rat equivalent, right? Or gotcha. the mouse equivalent of yeah. what we're giving them. And so there's not one single nutrient that we're like studying that is mm -hmm. like, oh, this is the bad one. So right. I'm not going to, I'm not here to demonize saturated fat <laughs> yeah. or carbs or anything. Like, <laughs> You're I not a nutritionist. I don't want yeah. the nutrition people to come <laughs> after me. I know that there's, you know, a, it's a highly contentious, yes. you know, field with a lot of emotion behind it. It seems, you know, yeah. people are very passionate about what diet is best for humans right? and, um, for, you know, brain function. But, but so what we study is again, um, what, what, what we know is that when these animals consume this diet, even just a very brief access to the diet, just a couple of days on really? the diet leads to significant cognitive impairments and increases in brain inflammation. But if we block the inflammation with a drug, you know, or mm. an antagonist in the, you know, we can inject directly into the brain that like prevents an inflammatory response that then that memory impairment is prevented. Mm -hmm. So we can still give them the diet, but the memory impairment isn't there. Gotcha. And that's because we blocked the inflammation. So we do know in the context of diet induced memory impairments in the aged brain mm -hmm. that inflammation is a causal factor because gotcha. when we remove the inflammation, mm -hmm. the effect goes away. So is there, uh, and I don't know if there's something like this exists right now, maybe there is, but, uh, would mm -hmm. there be a way to like have that diet 
avoid the con- cognitive uh, um, uh, negative effects. And, yeah. And obviously, you'd still probably like mm-hmm. gain weight and stuff because metabolism is a whole other thing, right? Yeah. Um, but is that that is that a po- that you're saying that's a possible thing outcome? Yeah. So we we've, we've published our lab. By the way, everything I'm telling you is published, um, so I'm not giving away any like new information or anything <laughs> like that. But our, you know, the lab has published data showing that um, exercise, which mm-hmm. is known to be anti-inflammatory, um, can prevent diet-induced memory impairments okay. in aged rodents. Mm-hmm. Um, so we know that can mitigate it. And um, we've also published that consuming... Um, a supplementation of the diet with the omega-3 fatty acid DHA, okay. which is omega-3s are the, um, you know, uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids that are in fish oil. Yeah, krill common, oil. Krill well, oil, yeah. yeah. All those. It's yeah. a common over-the-counter supplement mm-hmm. that people can purchase for pretty low cost. Yeah. Um, you know, so diet supplemented with those can mm-hmm. prevent the effects of the high fat or uh, of the um, unhealthy diet. So are you saying that I can go and have myself a double Whopper with cheese and, and hit the Peloton <laughs> slurp some krill oil and maybe get by at the um, end of the day. I don't know if I would be comfortable <laughs> saying you get by, but I'd be comfortable in saying that it's better than not doing those things uh, and enough. eating the double Whopper with yes, cheese. Yeah. So, um, I, I can't say that, that, you know, that right, you no, can do yeah. whatever, eat whatever you want, just as long as you exercise and yeah. take this one supplement. Absolutely not. Yeah. There's no, there's no evidence to suggest that doing something just, you know, just that will prevent any negative outcomes, mm-hmm. at least brain outcomes of consuming a unhealthy diet, mm-hmm. but it's probably better than not doing those things. So, yeah. Um, so the guy that's been eating a Big Mac every single day for like 30 years. Is that a thing? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. His days are numbered. Maybe. I mean, then you get into, you know, I don't know exactly. I mean, if he's eating it with the, yeah, I don't know. I was going to say like, there's probably a whole other <laughs> bunch of factors. It's nuanced. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a, it's a very nuanced thing. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I don't know if, you know, it depends on what, what, I mean, if that's all he's consuming, you know, it depends on, you know, what yeah. else he's doing. I don't know what his like blood levels look like or yeah. anything like that. He but, runs a hundred miles to the McDonald's. Yeah. Eats well, that that's probably and fine. then runs a yeah. hundred miles back home. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you talked, you spoke a little bit about, um, you know, you're, you're not quite sure if we're on the cutting edge or the cusp of developing a solution, whether it's a drug or, you know, some sort of prescribed uh, diet or activity to, um, to reverse the effects of Alzheimer's or, you know, does that, does that, is that a dissuading or at least, um, is that a little like uh, negatively impacting maybe your uh, your pursuit? Like, is that yeah? Is that hard to overcome? That like like maybe all the work we're doing won't lead to much movement in the in the medical field, or does yeah. it feel like a hopeless pursuit in in some way? Or and how do you cope with that? Um. Not for me because we aren't pursuing the typical route Mm -hmm. that one would do to try to prevent or reverse Alzheimer's. Like I said, we're focusing on early, early on, like before a human would even have like quantitative, like measurable, like brain changes, Mm -hmm. um, like with the typical, like pathological features that appear with mm-hmm. Alzheimer's disease. Like we're looking like very early on in, in the disease progression mm-hmm. and trying to understand like general mechanisms of cognitive decline, not necessarily Alzheimer's specifically, but just general mechanisms of like age associated cognitive decline. And then we're also ap- applying that same like concept to like an actual like Alzheimer's disease model mm-hmm. as well. But mm-hmm. like a lot of what we study, we don't think is necessarily specific to Alzheimer's disease. Mm-hmm. It can be applied to preventing Alzheimer's disease, right. but in general, it's like just general mechanisms of like synaptic plasticity and like like um, brain um, 
brain function that declines with mm -hmm. aging. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, so I wouldn't call myself like a traditional like Alzheimer's disease researcher where we're looking at the actual right. pathological changes, you know, the accumulation of these plaques and tangles that are required for diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. um, we're not actually studying those as like a therapeutic target. Gotcha. I still think what I said in the beginning that pursuing those as potential therapeutic, the plaques and tangles that are, you know, accumulating in the brain of Alzheimer's disease patients mm -hmm. is a real thing. It is happening. And I think that it's involved. They're not unimportant. So looking at ways to like prevent that from happening or, mm -hmm. you know, therapeutic targets that target those things, I think is valid, mm -hmm. but that's not what we're doing. And so I think th that that helps because the traditional route has always been to target those pathological, like late stage changes. Mm. And if I was one of those researchers, maybe I would feel different. Like maybe I would feel a little discouraged or yeah. like, you know, like what, you know, what's going, like, you know, conf but you know, with, with what we're doing, trying to identify these early mechanisms, it's kind of like a more like wide open, not wide open, but it's a more yeah. like open field basically. Mm -hmm. And so there's lots of room for discovery. Yeah. Um, and so I'm not, I'm optimistic <clears throat> actually, because I think that once more efforts are being applied at, into this area, like we're going to, you know, learn a whole lot. Yeah. Of information. I was going to ask, well, like what would be the best outcome for this type of research? Because, I know I'm just thinking out loud here, but like, I think it's a, I think I can speak for most people when I say that diet and exercise is really well understood to basically prolong your life. Yeah. You know, obviously like not smoking and things like that. And, and so, so how, what kind of impact do you think your, these, this kind of studies, these studies can do? Um, and what, where does it lead to that could really, um, change the way we think about diet and exercise in terms of prolonging life. Yeah, I think basically what we've yeah, you, you yes, you're exactly right. Diet and exercise is already established as a effective way to prolong your quality of life mm -hmm. to increase your health span. It's going to prevent, you know, heart disease. It's mm -hmm. going to prevent um, diabetes, mm -hmm. metabolic syndrome, obesity, you know, all, all of these things that we know are bad for health span and bad for longevity. What I think, I don't know. I, I, maybe people value, I, I would like to think people value their brain more than mm -hmm. other parts of, you know, mm -hmm. maybe their, their waist size or, you know, their, their, their weight. You know, I feel like that like everyone understands the importance of having a well functioning brain. Mm -hmm. And so if we can learn the ways that diet and exercise are impacting brain function, not just for cognitive, you know, age related, you know, disorders like Alzheimer's, but just general like mental health, you mm -hmm. know, um, conditions like depression, anxiety, mm -hmm. schizophrenia, you know, it's likely that diet and exercise are playing a role or lack thereof, you know, unhealthy diet or lack of exercise are playing a role in all of these things related to the brain. Yeah. So I think that if we, the more research that's done that shows that these things really, really are so important for brain health. Um, I think that, you know, the best outcome would be to get, you know, it would help motivate people a bit better, you yeah. know, a bit more than like, okay, so like I gain, you know, 10 pounds, you know, mm -hmm. as I get older, like, you know, or, you know, I become a little bit more obese. Like that's just what happens as you age, right? Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. to, you know, some people accept that as a normal thing that comes with aging. Um, uh, you know, I hope that people wouldn't accept that just slow deterioration of the brain is inevitable, you know, <laughs> yeah, and right. I, 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 you know, and so maybe it would just, you know, help people, um, be a little bit more incentivized, I guess, to mm. take care of themselves. I don't, I don't yeah. know. Could it, could it lead to understanding specific food or nutrients or specific diets that can yeah. best, that are best for a, you know, a, a positive outcome down the road? 
Yeah, I think so. I mean, that's, I mean, people are doing that. I mean, yeah. people are trying to study like the Mediterranean diet, yeah, yeah, um, you know, yeah. veg, you know, just in general, people are trying to look at these sort of associations between various types of diets and like mm-hmm. long-term health outcomes. Mm-hmm. Like the problem is studying that in a clinical way, like in a very controlled manner Yeah, that isn't just like an observational study is really difficult to do in humans. Yeah, it's you need so tons hard to control, of tons of time, yeah. tons of money, tons of control yeah. over what the people are doing people and cheat. eating. Yeah. Yeah. And <laughs> It's so hard. Yeah. You know, I do not, I'm, I don't envy it. I think it's great that there's nutrition, you know, human nutrition researchers, yeah. but it's a very difficult field to have solid controlled experiments yeah. with accurate results. And like that. you know, that's why there's a lot of contention and mm-hmm. like fighting it seems and within that field, you know, yeah. and, um, you know, Oh, this diet's best. And Oh, well, this diet's best for this. And this diet's best for that. Mm-hmm. And it's, you know, well, this type of, you know, it's just every, you know, there's so much, so many variables. And so I don't know if we will ever learn the exact optimal diet for every, like there is no optimal mm-hmm. diet for everyone. Right? right. Yeah. You know, and, you know, I, I, I just, I, I think that that my goal anyway, isn't to find the perfect diet to prevent. It's to understand how does the diets we do eat mm-hmm. make it, you know, cause brain function to decline. And if we can learn the mechanisms of how it's happening when we're eating these unhealthy diets or doing these other unhealthy lifestyle Mm -hmm. habits, maybe we can, you know, that'll, you know, give rise to new therapeutic targets where we can design a drug or behavioral intervention that Mm -hmm. can mitigate what you might be doing. Like exercise is a good example. Like, okay, Mm -hmm. if we're going to be eating these crappy foods, maybe we can learn that like X amount of exercise per week will Mm -hmm. like stave off the worst Mm -hmm. effects of those diets. Right. And, um, I mean, or I don't think that taking a pill you know a magic pill is like should be the goal and answer for everyone it's easier to, yeah taking a pill is easier than changing human behavior for sure um but so it's fine i guess if that's like an outcome that happens mm-hmm. like if our research finds that oh like this molecule released from this immune cell is like a specific trigger of the you know diet induced cognitive mm-hmm. impairment let's design a drug that targets that mo- you know yeah. and, and like I could see why that would be beneficial and like, I wouldn't be opposed to it, but Mm -hmm. you know, it, it, I, I, you know, it's hard to say like what the ultimate like definitive goal would be or should be for this Mm -hmm. type of research. I think knowledge Mm -hmm. is power and understanding how something as prevalent as food that Mm -hmm. we consume that everyone does every single day, um, is impacting our brain function and our immune system Mm -hmm. is, you know, the more information we can learn about that, the better off we will be. I I wish there was like, and maybe there is something out this out there that's adjacent to what I'm about to say. But if there was like an app where you could put in exact your exact nutrition or diet, yeah. and it's like here's what you need to do to basically reverse all the damage <laughs> you just did. Yeah, it's like specific exercise, specific supplements, specific this, that, and the other, based on a very hyper focused you know, granular understanding of exactly what you just consumed. Yeah. Uh, because I, I think, I think you're right. I think, I think it's more about controlling your external environment and influence over just like taking a magical yeah. pill. It's probably going to be, and also magical pills cost money. Uh, yeah. not everybody can afford something like right. that. So yeah. it, to be more accessible, maybe a, a, some, some kind of like free a- app or something that can be used. Cause I, and that's the best way to, to, to your point to spread the understanding and the knowledge yeah. is like understanding what you're consuming and how it affects your body and what you can do to basically yeah. combat that. I, I am a huge fan of staying in your own lane. So saying what I think should happen, what the outcome should be of my research and all that is like a little bit out of my lane. I'm not mm-hmm. a medicinal chemist. I'm not yeah. some, I'm not a pharmacologist. I'm not a nutritionist. I'm not a exercise coach, right? Like yeah. I don't know, I'm not going to apply. I don't have the expertise to yeah. advise people on exactly mm-hmm. what they should be consuming and how to, you know, 
live their best life, I guess. But what I can do is tell you what you are doing or what the types of foods you are consuming is doing to your brain or to a rat or a mouse's brain. And then that knowledge that is learned, you know, can foster collaborations with other scientists and other Mm -hmm. experts that can help us figure out how to like apply that information and make people's lives better. Like I think a great outcome of some of the work that we're doing would be like a pharmacologist or medicinal chemist, like sees our papers or our grants and is like, Hey, like, I think I know how to like design a drug that would selectively target the thing that you've just showed is critical for Mm -hmm this diet induced memory impairment. Mm. And then we partner with them to make that happen. Like I wouldn't be the one designing the drug right. or anything like that, but I can help test it. I can help like learn what it, you know, how effective it is and all that stuff. But like, I don't know, or like, Oh, like I am a exercise physiologist and I know that doing this exact exercise or this type of routine or whatever lowers the levels of this thing that you just showed is like important. Mm. And so let's, introduce that as a possible like intervention and test it and see like, you know, so I think those are the types of things that are likely to happen Mm. to to come with the research um, as opposed, you know, it's all a long ongoing, like indirect, you know, process. So what, what is uh, the specific terminology or name of the type of research that you're describing on a general level, like research that will help the development of this or that? Is there a specific, name for that like you're not you're not you're not in a lab that's studying how to uh design a drug or right. design treatment or right. produce a product to yeah. sell yeah so what it what, is there a, is there a type of name for that for what i do yeah uh, what i would call i mean it's basic science basic science it's, it's not i mean it with translational components right like mm-hmm. we want to the, the work that we do does have translational value. Right. All yeah. the things I was just saying exactly. are like examples of the translational value. Mm-hmm. But what we do is we're, we're basic. I'm a basic scientist. Like I, you a basic bitch. <laughs> <laughs> like I, I study the mechanisms, yeah. you know, I study how in a very tightly controlled manner, how certain variables like diet, mm-hmm. um, are impacting mechanisms in neurobiological mechanisms in the brain that lead to memory deficits um translational scientists or you know medicinal chem like you know um neurologists or clinical researchers who might be doing similar types of stuff in human patients like actual humans mm-hmm. can you know the you know conversations or crosstalk between basic scientists and like clinicians is really important for driving you know the development of, of, of treatments. Mm -hmm. And I think that, um, so that would, you know, the job of it, it it would be the job of those people to take what the basic scientists are finding out Mm -hmm. and trying to figure out how to develop effective therapies. And we of course would help in the best, you know, to the extent that we can. It's like fundamental, understandings to yeah. build blocks onto. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So I look at like where the building blocks of mm-hmm. what more like translational or clinical scientists can use, um, mm-hmm. to, uh, you know, to uh, apply, apply. Yeah. yeah. To actually help humans. And mm-hmm. so what I, you know, a lot of people in my field, you know, who are basic, like, you know, um, preclinical scientists actually feel like, sometimes one of the things that they miss is that seeing that direct impact that they're having on, the reward on, a, the on a human's life. You mm-hmm. know, I am comfortable we're operating at this level because I understand that it's indirectly going to be helping people, yeah. you know, down the road. It might be 10 years from now, 20 years from now, or it could be next year. But, you know, adding to the body of knowledge of like the basic mechanisms through which brain function you know, through the way the brain works, I mm-hmm. think is going to indirectly be a benefit for, you know, medicine. Yeah. You guys are the unsung heroes. Yeah. I mean, I look at it as like, <laughs> you know, we help write the textbooks or, mm. you know, provide the body of knowledge that like doctors will learn in gotcha. med school, yes. right? Like MDs didn't, aren't the ones typically that, I mean, there are some MD 
PhD, you know, scientists that Mm -hmm. do both. But for the most part, like your MD isn't the one that is discovering new science, you know, and writing the textbooks Mm -hmm. and he's, they're teaching the textbooks to new medical students and like the, it's the basic scientists and, you know, that are, uh, you know, providing that foundational knowledge, scientific knowledge Hmm. is how I look at it. So tell me then, since uh, you can tell me how the brain works, what is this cocktail that I just (laughs) drank doing to my brain? Doing to your brain? Yes. What is the alcohol? It is a a cucumber mint vodka. (laughs) What did this just do? I don't know about the cucumber or the mint, but the (laughs) the vodka, you know, the alcohol, right? The ethanol in the, in the, in the vodka is going to be, um, you know, easily passing through the blood brain barrier and, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, get getting into your brain, interacting with receptors in the brain. What is the that, blood brain barrier? Just to yeah, linger yeah, on that, that for a second. That should be, yeah, I, I said it and I was like, I don't know if that's like a commonly, <laughs> that's, that, that, that's a household phrase. Right over right? everybody's head. So the blood brain barrier is basically a, um, I mean, to put it directly, it's a barrier between your blood and the brain. Okay. And so the blood can have a lot of, so the the brain is super important uh, organ, right, to protect. And so things that are circulating in your bloodstream, you know, maybe things like a toxin or a poison or bacteria. Mm-hmm. Well, you shouldn't have bacteria in your blood. If you do, you're like in sepsis, and that's <laughs> that that's not good. Mm-hmm. But like, you know, just things that are maybe okay for like your liver or like your other organs to like handle. Um, it's important to like protect your brain from, from those things. And so the blood brain barrier is a sort of network of, um, cells and, uh, like endothelial cells and like proteins that surround the blood vessels that innervate the brain. So you still have blood vessels that innervate all over your brain, Mm -hmm. but, you know, deliver oxygen, you know, deliver, um, glucose, you know, things that are important for brain function, um, but the, um, the, the layer of sort of tissue or cells, um, around the vessels in the brain are much more complex and, um, restrictive than other organs in your body. And it, what, what that does is it prevents things from getting into your brain that could potentially be harmful. Okay. And so alcohol is something that can easily surpass the the blood brain barrier hell yeah and um get in there baby and it um you know for probably a there's no positives that can come of alcohol from getting into your brain <laughs> yeah um so i don't know why we other than uh, liquid courage <laughs> yeah. and so what it's doing is it's it's working on like basically like you know gaba circuit you know gaba is an important inhibitory mm-hmm. neurotransmitter and it's sort of it's basically like lowering your inhibitions essentially Mm -hmm. it's sort of it's a depressant i think we've all learned that in like basic like high school like classes like alcohol is a depressant and Mm -hmm. it's sort of it's working through a myriad of neurotransmitter systems but one of them is is gaba and it sort of is going to be I think first affecting like your, I think one of the initial regions that alcohol impacts is like your prefrontal cortex, you mm-hmm. know, which is like right here behind your forehead. Mm-hmm. That's really important for like decision making and like executive function and like, you know, like a filter basically. Yeah. And so that's one of the first regions that alcohol gets to. Um, so that's that why when you're, affects. when you're drinking, you're a little more <laughs> confident. You probably hold your inhibitions less, are lowered. You, yeah. You're less uh, to hold back uh, yeah, what exactly. you want to say in a conversation. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It kind of lubricates the, the socialness yeah. between. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. exactly. Okay. And so, so that's probably, you know, this alcohol is probably working on, you know, your, GABA system in your prefrontal cortex to like ever so slightly. I mean, you didn't consume a lot. It, yeah. I don't know how high. It was 1.5 yeah. ounces. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, it's probably not doing too, too much at this point. No. But, you know, if you took a couple more over a brief period of time, 
you might, you know, start saying some things that, you know, would, you might not have ordinarily <laughs> said. I don't know. I'm a, I'm a composed <laughs> drunk. Yeah. So I, uh, I like to think that I can um, hold my liquor. Yeah. But uh, maybe my <laughs> wife uh, would say otherwise. <laughs> but uh, uh, so what else is it doing in, in the brain besides affecting your... I mean, too much of it will be cortex. neurotoxic, right? Yeah. Like too much of it will literally kill neurons. And so, you know, that's, I mean, you can die from you right. know, consuming too much alcohol. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not an expert on exactly what circuits and what, you know, receptors and all that and exactly mm-hmm. how alcohol is affecting it. But I can tell you generally that it's, you know, what I just said, it's lowering your inhibitions, you know, there's like some driven. motor loss of motor function. Yeah. Loss of motor function like for like sure. That. You know, it's, it's, it's just impacting or decreasing the ability, uh, you know, the, the, the activity of a lot of those, of those mm. circuits that control, um, motor function, coordination, um, you know, stuff, <laughs> stuff like that. So <laughs> when somebody's going through a stress, stressful time, maybe they're grieving the loss of somebody or they just broke up, had their heart broken. Mm-hmm. So they like quickly run to alcohol and it makes <laughs> them feel less of those feelings. Yeah. Is there an understanding of why that happens? I personally don't know. I mean, I'm sure there is. I, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't study the effects of alcohol yeah. on emotions or, you know, neurobiological function, but I would think that, you know, part of what I just said is, mm-hmm you know, going to contribute to that, you know, it's yeah. sort of inhibiting thing, you know, it, it's going to be inhibiting or blunting those, you know, emotions, but as you know, it can also exacerbate them, it right? Can, yeah. If you lower your inhibitions mm-hmm. of, you know, um, you know, you might start, you know, saying something or you might, you know, drunk text or call that person that you just broke up with or, you know, it, it, it when ordinarily you wouldn't have. And so, I don't know. I think in general, alcohol to some people helps relieve stress and people who are grieving the loss of somebody, whether it's through death or a breakup, Mm -hmm. um, you know, might be just wanting, you know, also to like just relieve the stress and severe amount of anxiety that they might be feeling Mm. in that, in that moment. Good to know. So bartender, (laughs) pour me another. No. Um, so what, uh, all the things that you explained here within here, uh, this podcast mm-hmm. about Alzheimer's are really interesting. I think everybody mm-hmm. probably would agree with me. Um, what that aside, cause I know that's what you're studying and you're excited and passionate about it. What other things, exciting things or breakthroughs in the last maybe four or five years are exciting to you within the field of neuroscience? Um, I'm a little biased, I guess, because I'm going to stay somewhat in my lane here. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to talk about Alzheimer's, but I think what genuinely is exciting about neuroscience right now is how much the immune system is important for Mm -hmm. brain function and how non-neuronal cells. So the brain is made up of like 50% of the cells in the brain are neurons, Mm -hmm. but that means 50% of the brain is not are not neurons. Right. Mm. And where our field is this conference that I'm going to, uh, tomorrow and for the rest of the week Mm -hmm. is basically focused on how non, I mean, it, it, it's focused on how the, 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 the importance of some of these other cells in the brain are like immune cell, like, like immune cells basically. And I mean, the, the conference is a neuroimmunology conference, but I think, the where the biggest excitement for me lies is how much these other cells that are kind of for historically understudied mm. in neuroscience actually impact the function of neurons. Mm. Um, and so we can apply, you know, concepts of neuroimmunology, this brain immune system interaction to a whole bunch of other, um, neurological or psychiatric disorders. Um, so not just Alzheimer's and like memory and aging, but things like depression, things like anxiety, general like stress, um, neuropsychiatric disorders, Mm -hmm. um, uh, personalities, you know, a whole bunch of stuff, you know, the, it's clear their evidence is accumulating that 
some sort of immunological or inflammatory component is possibly contributing to um, most of these disorders, or at least a subset of these disorders, right? And so I think that that's where the biggest sort of, for me anyway, excitement lies, is learning how the function of immune cells is contributing to brain function in a whole host of areas, not just learning and memory. Gotcha. So just taking care of your immune system. Yeah. What is that? I mean, that probably <laughs> boils down to diet and diet exercise, exercise right? right? Like, so, so that, that's what we, we are finding, right? Like yes. diet and exercise or, you know, um, uh, sort of any, any sort of environmental trigger, mm -hmm. like an infection or a surgery, you know, is going to, a likely the likely reason that it alters brain function is through an inflammatory or like immune system mechanism gotcha and so you know i was worrying i was curious about that because <laughs> that was uh, you named a couple other things yeah that you're studying you know uh you know the, the diet and the stress and all that uh, but the surgery component yeah. kind of was a little stuck out to me so I'm, I'm curious more about like, you know, so you say it's the inflammatory immune response to the surgery that causes sometimes the cognitive de decline. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. And th this is a common thing in, well, I don't know if it's common, but it's most if, you know, so pa older patients, mm -hmm. like people, um, you know, as you get older, it's likely you will have to have some kind of surgery. Right. You can just have some kind of distress is happening in your body. They might have to do like a abdominal surgery or mm -hmm. a hip surgery or, you know, something like that. Right. And what has been, you know, a common phenomenon that's been observed in the clinical studies or in clinical populations are an older person goes in for surgery, mm -hmm. comes out, or they go into the surgery cognitively intact, or, you know, for the most part, totally fine. Yeah. They recover, they, they come out of the surgery and they have a little bit, you know, some memory impairment and, you know, for the first few days, it might be, oh, they're just, you know, a little Foggy, brain fog from yeah. the anesthesia and from the stress of the surgery, but it's not getting any better, you know? And now we have weeks later or even months, years later, they're still not recovered and they're actually now developing like full-blown dementia. And this is a thing that's called like post-operative cognitive decline mm -hmm. or post-operative cognitive delirium, I think is another like name for it. Gotcha. POCD basically. And so what our lab and others have shown is that the effects of this surgery are, you know, in, on brain function or memory function is likely the inflammatory response that's elicited by hmm. the surgery um, in the body, but also in the brain like that, mm -hmm. you know, communication from the body and the brain is happening all the time. And so wow. a, a, prof like, a big inflammatory response outside the brain can send a signal to the brain that ultimately ends up causing a inflammatory response locally in the brain. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so yeah, that's an unfortunate thing that can happen in the older population is this, you know, people go into surgery and they just never come out the same. Right. And so, yeah, that's another focus of the lab is, is looking at how that happens or why that happens. Would it be hypothetically then beneficial to give something to that patient that to block the inflammation yeah. to the, basically prevent that from happening? Is that like kind of the, the understanding or like the hope <laughs> or the goal? Yes, that yeah. is the goal. Okay. Yeah. And we've shown that that can happen. Um, mm -hmm. You know, if we block the inflammation from occurring, yeah. we, we can prevent the surgery from causing memory deficit. Similar to the diet, <clears throat> mm -hmm. it's likely that the mechanisms between surgery and diet are slightly different. Mm. Um, but it's possible that there's going to be a lot of overlap. Actually, um, mm. you know, common immunological or inflammatory mechanisms might exist between these two factors: diet and surgery. And so. Um, you know, we are doing research that sort of, you know, looking at the, you know, similarities with and, and differences with that, um, hmm. but, you know, between these two factors. Okay. So, um, I don't, none of that's published, so I'm not going to, you know, I don't, I don't want to say one way or another what yeah. the data are looking like, but yeah, it's, 
it's a hunch. Um, it's it's <laughs> it's interesting. Yeah. And um, so, and, and and same thing with like a peripheral infection. And mm-hmm. when I say peripheral, what I'm referring to is something outside of the nervous system. Um, and so, a peripheral infection like a bacterial infection or a viral infection that doesn't infect the brain. These things we've known for decades can cause brain dysfunction and brain mm. inflammation. And so, you know, we our lab has also um, a while back sort of led or pioneered some of that early work looking at like peripheral bacterial infections and how that ultimately leads to brain inflammation, cognitive deficits and aged H brains. Um, and so, so yeah, I mean, I think there's some common themes throughout all this is that any sort of anything that causes an inflammatory response outside the brain can potentially lead to changes in the brain because of this two way communication between the brain and Mm -hmm. the immune system. So well, shout out to the Ohio state university (laughs) science labs. It wasn't a surprise (laughs) to anyone in this field that like COVID, which causes a significant, you know, immune reaction in the periphery would mm-hmm. lead to long-term consequences in the brain. Yeah. And unfortunately we are seeing that now. Yeah. Um, but like, that's not a surprise to anyone that's mm-hmm. like in this field. Cause we know, I mean, it's been known and documented from other types of infections and other mm-hmm. types of, you know, influenza can cause brain inflammation and can cause mm-hmm. cognitive deficits and long-term consequences. So mm-hmm. what we're seeing with COVID-19 you know, wasn't really a surprise, um, to at least not, unfortunately not a surprise, you know, to, to someone in the, in this field that's like studying this is, is, uh, the Ohio state university, uh, studying COVID in, in some capacity. Do you have, uh, uh, colleagues that are doing that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, There's quite a few actually. Um, I don't really know them. Uh, well, I know one, I'm, I'm, acquaintances with one of the people in one of the labs that is studying, um, SARS-CoV-2, but, Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, there are labs at Ohio state that are working on, um, that virus. Yeah. And do you have any idea of like what specifically they're looking into? Uh, Not off the top of my head. I don't. Yeah. Mm, Interesting. Um, all this is really fascinating. And for people who are listening and wanting to learn more or just, dip their toes into and get access to knowledge and information and learn more about neuroscience. I mean, (laughs) besides like subscribing to medical journals (laughs) and going to conferences, you know, things that are typically gate kept by (laughs) the, the, the community. Sure. How, what is the best way in your opinion to pursue this knowledge? Yeah, that's a very loaded. Qu- I mean, yeah, that's a question I think about often. You know, it's a big passion of mine too. Is like talking to non scientists about science. I think that um, if we did that, it would kind of demystify the enterprise of science mm-hmm. a little bit. I think there's it's complicated, and people tend to not really trust or understand, you know, or, you know, trust things that they don't really understand. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think that what has happened over the last three plus years with COVID has only exacerbated, um, the distrust in, in science a little bit, um, unfortunately. And so because of that, it's a, this question you asked is something I think about often. And, I think that some of the better ways to learn about science is finding good science communicators, you Mm -hmm. know, that are working really hard to give, to bring science to a wider audience and to sort of de, de, you know, you know, simplify the, the, the literature, simplify Mm -hmm. the concepts and um, talk about it in a digestible format. And, you know, but I think it also is going to require a little bit of work, you know, Mm -hmm. like on the part of the consumer, you know, I think, you know, reading a, you know, trying to get a basic understanding of like how science is done, what the scientific method is, you know, basic understanding of like statistics and 
data analysis and, you know, um, you know, all, just all, all the parts of the scientific method, I think, are going to be important, you know, so mm -hmm. good public education, like teaching science in a way that's practical and not just as a list of facts, mm -hmm. I think is really important. Like, I don't know about you, but when I was in, you know, K through, or, you know, you know, kindergarten through uh, yeah. high school and even in college, science class was like a class that you just memorize things. Yeah. And it honestly wasn't until graduate school that I realized that science is a process mm -hmm. and a way of um, uncovering new information and not a list of facts. Right. And so like understanding concepts and, yeah. and the way that, and also the history. Yeah. I think on understanding that giant science changes yes. frequently yeah. too is, is it, it, it's not a, it's not a hard set dogma. Exactly. Orthodox, dogma yeah. should have no place in the word dogma should have no place in science, mm -hmm. right? Because yeah. it's always subject to change mm -hmm. and belief systems don't matter in science. You know, it should only be the data. And so under, but that's not how it's taught. It's taught as like learning, just memorizing things. Like, yeah. And, um, so it starts there, you know, I think is important. And then people can be a better position to consume some of the stuff that really good science communicators are yeah. putting out there. Well, and, how, how and, would you, how would you to, to kind of just linger a little bit on understanding the fundamentals mm -hmm. and the, the scientific method, how, what's the best way to do that in your, in your opinion? Uh, I mean, <laughs> I don't know. I'm not, I don't have a, you know, Get I don't your GED have, folks. Yeah. I don't, uh, I don't, <laughs> um, you know, people, tr they, they try it with labs, right? Like, yeah. you know, you always have like a lab course, like even in, like high school, I think there was like labs that you had to do in mm -hmm. science class, like the anatomy class. Oh, I don't know about yeah. the anatomy class we had, but like, you know, in a basic biology class in high school, there might be like a biology lab component where you're like doing like kind of pre-designed experiments and like mm -hmm. kind of going through the process and all that. Gotcha. I don't know. I mean, I just, I don't think it's hard to teach and hard to grade, um, you know, but I think moving away from like multiple choice tests and mm. just flashcards and like just learn these facts for this test and forget about them afterwards, I think are, you know, not that conducive to learning the scientific process and learning right. the scientific like method. Critical and that's, thinking. That's and, typically yeah. how it's taught. So I, I'm not a correct, I don't, I don't design curriculums. I don't know. Like maybe you, you know, should, sounds like but, you need to get into that but, conversation. <laughs> you know, someone, you know, a curriculum that relies, like you said, on critical thinking mm -hmm. and sort of, um, you know, open, you know, yeah, just crit, crit, critical thinking and designing experiments and like trying to articulate or, you know, um, you know, the best way to, test a hypothesis or to arrive at a conclusion, you know, developing a science curriculum that would teach students how to do that, I think mm -hmm. would be a better way than doing what they do now, which is just here's a multiple choice test of like 50 questions and yeah, you have a week to study and yeah, move on. Um, but in terms of like, if people who want to learn more about, you know, science that, you know, you know, I mean, that that's like a big like structural change, right? Like mm -hmm. changing the curriculum of like <laughs> public education is yeah. a tall task. Right? Maybe you're an adult that went through that, yeah, exactly through the system, but I would you've say, you've dipped out of it. It's 20 yeah. years later now, yeah. and you're like, man, I really want to get back into that. I would say, you know, there's great podcasts and YouTube channels out there that so people are, who are teaching it. Uh, in layman's terms and communica yeah. science communicators. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, some of my favorites would be um, people like uh, you mentioned him at the beginning, but people like Andrew Huberman, who mm -hmm. has the Huberman lab podcast. Okay. You know, I think he does about as good a job as you can at articulating very complex topics in a digestible way. It's pretty long form. It's pretty dry. And a lot of times it is sort of like listening to a college lecture. I mean, he is a professor, so that's what he knows. I personally, I like it. I'm a scientist. I consume it. I follow it along, you know, follow along with it really well. But 
I could see how like a non-scientist might get a little overwhelmed with it. Mm -hmm. Um, I think he does a deep, but again, he does a decent job as you probably can with at breaking it down as simply as, as, as possible. And I, I, I think he's a pretty effective communicator of complex topics. Mm -hmm. Um, so, I mean, there's other ones as well. I mean, The Drive by Peter Atia is another podcast that I really like. Okay. He focuses a lot on longevity and aging. Mm-hmm. Um, so I like that. But, you know, he also does a lot of other stuff too. Um, you know, atherosclerosis, heart disease. I mean, he's kind of like a, he is an MD, but he does have a very good background in like science communication or um, uh, science and uh, the actual, you know, um, um, research. And so he... I think his podcast is also pretty good, but I think all of these are, they do assume a lot of the listener in my opinion, Mm. you know, like I think that, you know, you have to have somewhat of a foundation at least going into these podcasts um, to get the most out of it Mm. in my opinion. But I, I I just, I don't, I don't know. I, I, besides that, I don't know, you know, off the top of my head, like really good, like, Mm you know, podcasts that would, you know, be more geared towards like people who have zero background. Well, you mentioned YouTube science. as well, a video format. Is there anybody yeah, yeah, specifically the, or any channels you want to call out? Those same channel. Like, yeah, you know, the, they're all Huberman, video. Yeah. You know, they have the YouTube component to it. Okay. Gotcha. Um, so, so, so yeah, that, 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 that's, that's one of them. Um, I can't remember the name of it. Um, there's a YouTube channel that does like really good science animations. Um, okay. I just can't remember the name off the top of my head. It starts with a K. It's Got really, it. it's a really long, long word, or hard, <laughs> hard word to pronounce. Okay. Um, but I think they've done in the past, they've been mentioned as a channel that does a good job of, you mm. know, communicating, you know, complex topics. Cool. So, but yeah, I think that it's, you know, there's people in that space that are doing a good job, Mm -hmm. but you know, there's always, uh, you know, people can, it it, it can always be done, done better. And, you know, it's not, not everybody's going to like, you know, like, it like one style of communication isn't going to be able to, Mm -hmm. you know, be applied to everybody. Yeah. I like to, uh, I like to listen to Lex Friedman's podcast a lot. He has a lot of great scientists on, including Andrew Huberman. Um, other people like David Sinclair and, yeah, and things and, yeah. and other scientists. Lex and, is a really good podcast for that. Mm-hmm. He's more of an interview format, right? right? Where he will bring on the experts mm-hmm. in their respective fields and talk in depth for hours about yeah. a topic. And I think people like him and of course the whole podcast space in general has, I think shown that there is an appetite out there for long form conversation and long form, like, you know, media, Mm -hmm. you know, that I think is great. You know, I think Mm -hmm. that it's probably wouldn't not what people predicted. Like I wouldn't have thought honestly that there's people out there that want to listen to like three straight hours or four hours of like, two people just talking about Mm. a topic Mm. and but i think that these podcasts have like millions and millions of subscribers and listeners and i think that it shows that there really is an appetite out there for like consumption of really high level complex material and as long as it's done in a way that is like enjoyable and like easily digested so, yeah, I, I I like his uh, particularly because he he is a great interviewer. Um, yeah, he has he, really good thoughtful questions. Quite, yeah, yeah, he provoke he's provocative in, mm-hmm. in a in a in a respectful way. Uh, yeah, and uh, you know, so so I I can see how maybe somebody who's not uh, an active listener, yeah. um, you know, cause it, the, the guest is typically talking to him instead of to a general audience. Right. Some people do assume the responsibility <laughs> of talking to a general yeah. audience, yeah. but, um, a lot of times maybe they don't break things down as, as, uh, best as they could, uh, mm-hmm. cause they're, they're talking to Lex, who is a very smart, one of the smartest people, you know, yeah. uh, in the format, <laughs> in mm-hmm. my opinion. Um, but uh, no, I think everybody should check out you know the other podcasts that mm-hmm. you if you're if you're more interested in learning more about what Michael's talking about and other things adjacent to neurology and um, neuroscience mm-hmm. and uh, and all that good stuff. Um, 
So let me ask you another question. I think it it's related, but I, I, I think it's also very topical, um, especially in the last three years. Um, would you consider science to be a form of spirituality or religion? What do you mean? Uh, well, I mean, I think there's like, um, we talked about dogma. We talked about orthodox a little bit. Yeah. Uh, some, some people would, I think, argue or consider science, at least in the politi- politi- political environment that we've kind of yeah. seen science enter in the last three years because of COVID, yeah. to be some a, a, a form of a form of uh, uh, orthodox, like put on a pedestal, kind well, of. Well, there's there's that, but the, but also it's like it, um, Christians uh, don't question the teachings of the Bible, right? And some people would say, uh, or at least there's like a maybe an unformed opinion mm-hmm. that people cling to science as fact or, or as a, or as, as a similar thing as Christians would, would, you know, yeah. compare it to the Bible. And what's your opinion about that? Um, I don't see it that way. Be mainly because science allows the consensus to change. I don't know. Like if someone is doing that for science, you know, is kind of, using science as sort of their spiritual guide through life. It's not something that is stagnant, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's not something that is, this is my belief no matter what. Right. Without, no, no matter what anyone can say, you can't shake my faith or Mm -hmm. belief in X. That's not, I mean, if people are doing that with science, they're not doing Doing it it right. right. Yeah. Yeah. So (laughs) I don't think of it that same way because science is self-correcting. Science is always self-improving. There's, you know, if, you know, it takes a long time and many, many years and studies, you know, to kind of form a true like consensus. But even that is like, it's always subject to change upon new or better data. Mm -hmm. And so I don't think that it works in the same way that a religious um, dogma would mm-hmm. work. Some some of the criticism I've heard personally through consumption of, of podcast media and also mm-hmm. just, um, you know, other conversations I've had with friends mm-hmm. is the um, reluctancy to change based on the the foundation of ego of, of the conductor of science, basically. Mm -hmm. Um, so if you spent your entire career studying Alzheimer's and Mm -hmm. you made some critical breakthrough and you're well known for this right? and you, you know, you're well published and you've won awards and all of a sudden 10 years later, there's another hotshot scientist (laughs) that comes out with a, with a discovery that basically, you know, completely contradicts your finding and that person gets completely attacked or um, undermined or pinned down from, you know, maybe publishing or mm. establishing that as the new orthodox, if you will. Yeah. Um, do you do you see that as a as a as a relevant issue in, in the industry of science? Um, yes and no. I think that it is. I think science could be better. Uh, and when I say science, I mean like, well, science is just like the enterprise, a collective right? Of, like, yeah, yeah like people the, <laughs> conducting academic right? institutions, yeah. mm-hmm. um, academic journals, you know, scientific journals, like the, as you said, like, you know, the quote unquote gatekeepers of science, <laughs> um, could probably be better to mm. being open to, um, more against the grain ideas, mm. you know, that challenge the orthodox, <laughs> You know, here I am using religious language to like, describe, <laughs> but like, you know, uh, maybe the orthodox is wrong to use, um, to that challenges the consensus. Yes. Right. Um, yeah, the understanding. Yeah. And I think that, but I think over time, like the data will prevail. Mm-hmm. I think the best data ultimately prevails. The data that are most replicable, the data that are most, you know, um, compelling and, Um, with the least amount of holes in, you know, the experiments, you know, confounds Mm -hmm. and all that. I I think that that truly is 
maybe it's naive, but I mean, I think that is generally what prevails. Mm -hmm. Um, and, but yeah, I do think that in general, I, I think good scientists should leave their ego at the door and follow the data. Mm -hmm. And I think for the most part, that's what happens in science. Yeah. Um, some of the louder voices maybe have the larger egos and maybe that that, you know, clouds the perception a little bit. But mm -hmm. I think in the end, the best ideas and the best data ultimately do come through. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if it's like, I don't think that it is a, uh, existential problem okay. for science. Gotcha. What's your opinion, your, your honest opinion about the scientific peer review process? And is there a way to enhance that and make it better? Yeah, this is a topic that a lot of academics like to complain about. Um, without a, tr but with, but I'll say off the bat, I don't know of like a better way to mm. do it. Um, so, how it typically works is you submit your data to a journal that you want to publish in and the editor in chief of that journal, you know, or the, the, the it will be assigned to an associate editor. Mm -hmm. You know, the, you, the journal usually has, you know, anywhere from like five to 10 associate editors that are involved in like handling the, review of that journal. Mm -hmm. And so you'll submit it, the editor in chief will assign it or reject it. I mean, he can, he or she can just immediately outright reject it if they don't think it's like suitable or within the scope of the journal. Um, and, but you know, if it gets through that initial, that's called a desk rejection, by the way, which I have experienced, but, um, like you know, personally your own work. Yeah. 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 Like we submit it and they're just like, we're not even going to send this off for review. You know, like mm. it's just not, it's not Ready. applicable for our oh. journal oh, or it's okay. not because of X, Y, and Z, you know? Okay. So we'll just submit it to another journal. But like if we get it, um, you know, past that stage, then it will be, um, then they will um, send out your paper to other experts in your field. So, you know, my field is neuroimmunology, aging, Alzheimer's, memory, you know, they'll send it to other scientists, professors, or um, scientists like me. I'm not a professor, but I am a reviewer all the time for scientific papers from a whole bunch of different journals. Uh, they'll contact people like me or people like, you know, faculty members at other institutions, um, who are experts in what that paper is studying to review the quality of the paper. Like, is this, do the data support their conclusions? Was this a well-designed experiment? Um, you know, what are the problems with it? What are the limitations? You know, just basically just evaluate the paper and, um, we will write the review. We'll send it back. And, and then we'll, uh, along with our review and detailed critique of what we liked or didn't like about it, we will mm -hmm. recommend a decision, you know, accept, which never happens right away, or, you know, a minor revision, which is a minor or a major revision is usually the most, you know, um, positive response you could hope for is that you're going to have to do some revisions mm -hmm. um, or we can just outright reject it. Um, mm. you know, without, like this isn't good science. Like you've completely yeah. missed the mark. Yeah. yeah. And, or the stuff that you have to do is too much mm. that it wouldn't be able to be done in the amount of time we would give you mm. for a revision. How much time is that typically? To be like three months. Okay. And so, um, I think it varies, you know, between journals, mm. but, um, and so, and all of this is anonymous on the part of the reviewers. The reviewers are anonymous. We know who, like, we see the author's names of the mm -hmm. paper, mm -hmm. but we don't, uh, but the authors- You don't put your name on Yeah, the response. authors do not know who the reviewers were. Mm -hmm. And so the authors get the reviews back and the initial decision made by the journal. Like I said, it's usually never an accept. You know, it's always like- Something. 
major revisions requested mm -hmm. or like minor revisions requested. And then you have, like I said, you know, X amount of time to make your changes and make your revisions and then resubmit it to the journal, mm -hmm. which then decides to send it back to the initial reviewers. And then they look at what they've done. You know, have they addressed all of your initial concerns? Do you mm -hmm. have new concerns that you didn't notice? at first, you know, sometimes that happens, you know, I, I will review a paper, they'll send it back. Their changes were good. But then like, because of that, I'm like, oh, like I actually noticed something else that might need to be mm, mm -hmm. tinkered with mm -hmm. or, you know, altered yeah. slightly. And, you know, so then you'll have to bring something else up and have them like, sometimes it can go through multiple res you know, mm -hmm. revisions. And, uh, you know, then ultimately, you know, if the reviewers decide that what has been revised is acceptable and there's no further concerns, then you recommend acceptance. Mm -hmm. um, and then the editor usually goes with that. Yeah. And uh, have you ever witnessed the editor going, no, not personally? No, I'm gotcha. sure it's happened, but right. I personally haven't experienced that. Mm. What well, would be um, a, a legitimate good reason if you had four peer reviews saying accepted <laughs> and the editor goes, no? I really don't know. I mean, I yeah. think that would be highly, that would be weird. Highly I mean, it would unusual, be, yeah, like it would questionable. Like yeah. Suspicious. Yeah. 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 I, yeah. I, I, I doubt, I mean, I'm sure it has happened. I just don't, yeah. I don't know if you, you know, pissed off the wrong was. guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so, um, that's kind of how the process works. Do I think there's problems with it? Sure. Like maybe the initial, mm. maybe the yeah, initial steel man, the argument here, steel man, the argument for it against it, a, against peer review. Mm hmm. Mm, I don't know. <laughs> like, um, I really don't know how to steal. I mean, I, I mean, you kind of stumped me there. Like, I don't know if there's a good reason not to have quality assurance, mm -hmm. you know, quality check of, of, of the work that's being published. Well, I don't think it's necessarily that the re not to have quality okay. assurance. It's the specific process. Like, and I think, I think what I'm getting to is like, what are the, what is the potential downside to the peer review process? Yeah. I think, you know, a potential downside is keeping, you know, what I was going to say is even then it's going to be hard, but I was going to say like maybe having the authors be anonymous as well. Like have it mm. both be like blind, like a double blind thing where like the reviewers don't know who wrote it mm. and the so authors egos don't get in the way. Yeah. But usually like if the writers of the paper cite themselves, you know, or mm. say like we have previously shown this and then cite a paper, like you can kind of figure out right. like yeah. who did it. Right. Yeah. And so it can be kind of hard. I guess you could write it in a way that doesn't implicate yourself, mm -hmm. but um, I think still um, keeping both processy or both parties blind could be one way to improve it to prevent egos or to prevent like um, people bias wanting to yeah. like say they're a competitor, right? And mm -hmm. they mm -hmm. are going to be you know submitting a grant or a you're submitting a paper that might be very similar and you want the mm. prestige of mm -hmm. being the first to show something. And so you might try to like bury a paper or something. I mean, this should not happen. And there, I'm sure you know, it does though. Right. Yeah. But like, you know, there have been certain cases where, you know, this has happened. Mm -hmm. And I think so things like that are obviously not great and not, mm -hmm. you know, I think, uh, give a bad name to the, the um, enterprise or the um, established, you know. Um, yeah. Well, the establishment you know, is just made up of humans. Yeah. And humans are humans. Humans have yeah. egos. He but humans, humans, um, uh, they hold value in awards and recognition yeah. and credibility. So they will probably tilt the scale in favor of maybe them receiving some of sure. that. But um, I mean, yeah, that's going to be true in every field. Absolutely. Ever yeah. To exist. But mm -hmm. I think the, science is one of the better ones that are equipped to like not have that influence the ultimate outcome. Right. Uh, because, because of, of data, because of the data, mm -hmm. because it's self-correcting because ultimately, you know, things are uncovered and, you mm -hmm. know, things can be retracted or things can you know, like, I don't know. Like it's, it's a generally like it truly is a self-correcting 
system. Yeah. And um, I think, so I think that the, you know, the issues with peer review are not, you know, so bad mm-hmm. that it requires an upheaval of yeah. the system. Of the system. I think there can always be improvements, but, you yeah. know. Do you get, this is a part of what you get paid to do? Um, is this an expectation that you, you are it's, doing it's this? It's definitely an expectation. Mm-hmm. Um, it's part of the service, right, to science, right? Mm-hmm. It, but it's not, you don't get paid directly for it. Right, like it's not something I don't get you paid. get extra for doing. Yeah, yeah, I do not get, reviewers of journal, of papers, to scientific journals, do not get paid for mm-hmm. the reviews that they do. If you get sent something to be peer-reviewed, are you allowed to be like, I don't have time to yeah. do this? Yes, And you go, yes. pass? Absolutely, okay. yeah. But you you tried to do. Is there like a quota that is like an uh, unofficial like stated thing that you like you should be reviewing? It's an expectation, but not no. a requirement that you should be reviewing four papers a year or whatever. No, I don't know about that. no. Okay. I, I I I reject more though than I accept because <clears throat> sometimes they're just not exactly my area of expertise or like mm-hmm. I don't feel comfortable evaluating it so I'll mm-hmm. say no or mm-hmm. maybe I do but like I just don't have time at the moment right. like I have too many other things happening yeah. and I'll just be like I can't even think about devoting a couple hours you know yeah. to, to doing this right now mm-hmm. um, and so I'll, I mean I probably reject the majority of the requests for review I think most oh, wow. most people who get requests to review reject the majority of them how many are um, you getting a year you think i mean it's monthly or weekly i mean i'm getting a ton like i mean i'd probably do at least one or two a month yeah probably but how many do you get get sent to you do you think a month uh, of the two that you accept how many are you yeah, like passing on uh, I, don't, I don't i mean a dozen ten, ten. maybe yeah, yeah. Okay. i mean it just depends like sometimes it seems to all kind of come at once too yeah um, it's like, you'll get a lot in a row mm-hmm. and then, or you won't hear anything for weeks or even, yeah. you know, a month or so. Is there, um, is there, you said your expectations for getting responses back as major or minor rev- yeah. revisions. Is there, is there something that happens or that you've witnessed, uh, where somebody feels maybe you witness it yourself where you feel like you need to give feedback just to justify your existence or like some people do this in yeah. corporate meetings where they just yes. say something or they repeat something that's already been said just to add feel like they're adding value by yeah. speaking i think so yeah and i think it's i think people who do this who review papers if there's truly you know I mean, there's usually always something that can be mm-hmm. addressed or fixed or improved, but you say that, that it's minor mm-hmm. and, you know, and so I, I don't think that, but I, I think that people should um, get in the habit of saying like, Oh, you know what? This was actually great. And mm-hmm. I don't have much to add or, you know, much value to, you know, yeah. would be, um, seen and changing anything, um, as a writer, like as a, as an author of a paper, I would love if that happened. (laughs) But usually, like I said, even if it's not completely, um, necessary, there's always something like minor that you can say, like a typo or Mm -hmm. like a figure could be improved, you know, like the graphs or something like that could be, you know, improved or like there's a slight mistake, you know, that was caught, you know, Mm -hmm. there's always like these like more like editorial things that Mm -hmm. can be picked up on. Have you ever witnessed that yourself where you've, you've submitted a paper back and you've gotten feedback and you're like, really, really? Yeah. 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 But you know, it's, it's usually fine because that means they liked it and it's going to get accepted. So like, it's fine. (laughs) Like it's like, okay, yeah, yeah, I'll change this graph or like, Mm -hmm. I'll like, add this sentence or like expand on this one point a Mm -hmm. little bit, you know, like stuff like that is fine to do. It's not annoying because like you got a great review and like, you're just happy to, it's an easy thing to address and you're going to resubmit it easily. Mm. So, but yeah, I do think that it is an expectation. Like as a reviewer, you feel like you're obligated to like find something wrong with the paper and Mm -hmm. like, that's what your job, like that's what you're there for, right? Is quality assurance. And so I do feel like that, Sometimes it's like unnecessary, mm-hmm. but there's always something though. Well, I think uh, we're just about in for two hours now, and I got one final question for you, which is 
speaking directly to the the young students in biology or in this field of neuroscience what's one piece of advice you can give them people who are maybe interested in pursuing phd work Mm -hmm. what what's one thing that you that you could speak to them directly to about Um, some advice i would say the best thing you could do is get into a lab environment that is conducive to learning and doesn't make you and encourages you to ask questions Mm -hmm. and encourages you to be very actively involved. I don't think it matters so much what the question that they're researching is at early stage, even in grad school, I would argue that like the question that you're asking, asking in science or trying to answer is it has to be important or it has to be like interesting enough for you to enjoy it or, you know, to, for you to like get up every day and devote like, you know, four to six years of your life doing it. But the better, the more important thing is the environment that you're in and how conducive of it is it of like really quality scientific training. Mm -hmm. Um, The relationship with the mentor, the mentoring style of the professor that's running the lab, Mm -hmm. the types of um, personalities and people that they bring into the lab, I think is going to be the more um, influential aspect of your training um, and that's true at the undergraduate and at the graduate and even the postdoctoral level. Mm. Um, so I would recommend just, you know, trying to, you know, and, and a lot of that is sort of intangible or subjective. Like it's more or less just like, are the people nice? And are they like, you know, like, are they encouraging you to ask questions and not like, you know, just giving you busy work and mm. just, not telling you why you're doing the thing that you're doing. You know, I I think it's important for, um, the, the learning environment to be really positive. And, um, so that's what I would recommend if they're, if if students who are interested in science is finding an environment like that. Cool. Awesome. Well, we finally got you on. Thank you. This was really fun. Uh, And I hope everybody listening uh, found this uh, to be entertaining at the very least. Um, If people want to follow you, (laughs) you don't really have public social media. I guess Twitter would be the most public one. What's your your handle? Um, I think it is at Michael Butler 91. Perfect. Um, But, um, but yeah, that would be other, other than that, you know, I don't have Mm -hmm. any like public social media, but you know, yeah we'll keep in touch <laughs> um hopefully next time you're on uh which is hopefully soon uh yeah. miles will be able to join oh, us yeah. and you can, yeah, can ask uh, yeah. ask some better questions than i have maybe <laughs> um thanks for watching everybody thanks for listening um catch us on instagram if you want to see what we're making pictures of the cocktails the recipes all that good stuff um, if you're interested in seeing where Miles is at currently, go to adventuringeyes.com or Adventuring Eyes on Instagram. And uh, until next time, adios. Stay See curious. <laughs>